So while Kumar comes on board and he talks about in the nasal anatomy, um, maybe I'm gonna show, I can show part of my presentation. So as we said, approaches we're gonna discuss and uh, you know, all of our panelists are gonna discuss in detail these approaches. I'm just gonna give you a uh, brief overview of some cases where I had to do one approach or the other. Uh, if we go into the anterior skull base, for example, here we have two pituitary adenomas and they both look a bit ugly um, at any point, uh, Paul, if you want to make any comments or any of the panelists, uh, I think that that would be welcome. But, you know, you see here these two pituitary adenomas. Um, one is native, the other one is multiply recurrent and radiated. Um, so these adenomas, uh, you need to look where is the optic chasm in relation to the tumor. And you will see that the position of the chasm is different in these two cases. And therefore, the approach I, I performed was also different. Also, when you see tumors that are, are going into the suprachasmatic space between the anterior cerebral arteries and the optic chasm, uh, I always worry. And I worry because of the perforating branches of the ACOM and the ACAs. In this case, the subcolossal artery, which can be a very relevant artery vascularizing the fornices and the mammillary bodies and anterior commissure. So, um, we publish about this because of what I'm talking about. The second one also looks like it's subarachnoid, fully subarachnoid, which makes it much higher risk. Ex exactly. That, so Paul made an excellent point in this, in this case right here. You know, a pituitary adenoma like this is subarachnoid. It doesn't respect the planes. You can see how it relates with the pituitary gland. So experienced pituitary surgeons like Paul, you know, sees this immediately and thinks this is not an easy case. And this patient was... Um, she is young and she presented with mild elevation of prolactin levels in the 140, 150, placed on cabergulum with no response. Um, and if you don't see a response, that makes me think that this is a resistant prolactinoma or an atypical prolactinoma, which are known to be more aggressive and more difficult to deal with. Um, and actually this case was in the middle of the peak of the pandemic, but I'm sorry, I had to do her because her vision was getting worse and she had terrible headaches. Um, and uh, so this is the uh, briefly the approach. You see, it's a very expanded approach. You can see the limbus of the sphenoid all the way to the planum. Even if I'm not going to open that anterior, um, I want to have that door exposed. And then I'm working on exposing the, you saw the pituitary gland. This is working on one cavernous sinus that is uh, wildly invaded, finding six nerve. That's the Doppler. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open the door of the uh, precasmatic sulcus. And the gland, I found the gland here is disconnected, but look at the perforating branch. It's a super hypophysial artery here. And uh, as Paul mentioned, this is super acne invasion. It's not respecting any planes. Um, it's, it's relatively easy to remove the tumor because it's soft and suckable. Um, but at the same time, you need to be very careful and very precise with your suction. And we use these teardrop suctions, right? That you can control uh, very well, but you, need to uh, you know do it very carefully because the periphery vessels are all in case you can see perhaps Hübner this is an interesting variation that's a meningeal branch that we sometimes see from the super hypophysial artery to the dura and uh, finally we see the stalk and this part also you know is the part that is you know uh, always nerve-wracking about Hübner around Hübner and subcalosal and then peeling the last pieces of tumor of the optic uh, apparatus. You can see how invasive this tumor becomes. But regardless, the Indonesian approach gives us you know, excellent access to this area. I don't hesitate uh, to uh, recommend this approach for, for such a tumor. And now at the same time, the versatility of the Indonesian approach is such that you can, I can now go into the cavern of sinus and then clean this cavern of sinus as thorough as I can. Um, you see how the dura of the of uh, the clinoidal space is being invaded. So I'm cutting it and coagulating it. Um, and this is at the end, at the end of the resection. So not an, not an easy case with not a complete resection. There is a little bit of residual tumor on the cavernous sinus that I left because the corrosive was very tortuous, but uh, a patient with, uh, with a very good outcome, uh, normalization of prolactin at this point. And the pathology confirmed this, a very, uh, been a, an aggressive subtype of, um, of adenoma. Um, and this is the post up again. So at the same time, and I'm going to show this case, and then uh, we'll see if, if Kumar is back with us. But 
just to pair it with the other one, this patient, um, also I had trouble with this one. So this patient had 2004 transcranial approach for the tumor you see there. The MRI is very bad, but this was done in, actually in China and that was the tumor. And they did that resection through a transcranial approach that I'll show you briefly. And then there, there is residual that is growing and then they write the residual actually twice uh, in two years difference. And you see um, what the residual is. And now the patient comes to me with, with this MRI and with progressive visual loss. And, you know, I do probably 99% of pituitary adenomas through an endonasal approach. Um, but this is the 1% that I decided not to do it endonasally. And it is because if you look at the optic apparatus, you see the optic chasm is being displaced inferiorly. And the tumor is, you know, occupying the interhemispheric fissure and, uh, um, you know, getting between, you know, the third ventricle and the anterior uh, cerebral arteries. And I very much worried that I was not going to be able to get access to that portion of the tumor. And also, uh, I would have to manipulate optic apparatus to get there. So you can see the approach they did in the past. She has a defect, they did a transfrontal approach. And you can see the relation of the tumor with the uh, anterior cerebral arteries. And again, this typically has been radiated twice. And uh, that always uh, brings a concern. So this is a subfrontal approach. What I did was a cranioplasty um, because he had that cranial defect. Um, so I uh, started doing the interhemispheric fissure approach and opened the anterior interhemispheric fissure, which wasn't easy. Uh, but I could get A2 controls and then I get to A1s on both sides. My concern was to surround the tumor <clears throat> and get all the vascular structures proximal and distal. And while I was dissecting, suddenly I started getting bleeding and uh, I didn't even see where, where it came from at that point. The vessels were so plastered against the tumor that were not purple, they were so uh, pale. But that's the, the, there is probably a perforant avulsion right there um, that I had to um, solve with, with, with a clip and then continue. <clears throat> so that was an unfortunate event, but you know we were able to solve it. And um, now you can see the optic chasm is clearly displaced down. And now I'm taking the tumor from uh, the third ventricle, which is now widely open and uh, really terrible planes and stuck to the vessels. But finally, we were able to, to achieve a, uh, a good resection. And the optic chasm was all displaced down, as you can see in this picture. And uh, um, I think it was a good idea to go into nasal. And what was unfortunate is that the periphery branch was wrapped anteriorly, which is so unusual. Um, and this patient, unfortunately, got a stroke in the anterior commissure. But, you know, as we said, better luck than, than good because this patient actually had no deficits. As we said, the subcalosal artery, which is probably the periphery branch that was above, can vascularize the fornix, but in this case, it did only vascularize the anterior commissure. So the patient had no deficits whatsoever and you had an excellent outcome. But if you are not lucky or the patient is not lucky, you can have a significant deficit from, from, uh, from, the, this, uh, from this injury. So um, let's see, uh, Kumar, are you with us? He is not on yet. He's not on yet, okay. Um, hey Juan, can I make a comment? Absolutely then. Those are two really nice cases and really demonstrate the, the importance of knowing, you know, where the chiasm is, whether you go from above or below. Um, really tough, tough cases. You know, the, on this second case, on your subfrontal approach, do you, did you do a, just a, a bicoronal incision? Do you use the old incision or what? Yeah, I did, I, I did use the old incision. Yeah. And um, I had to commit to a chiropractic because, you know, as you saw, here, you know, she had this defect sure. there. The frontal assembly was open. I found even wax inside. I mean, it was kind of a disaster. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. Um, you know, this is one that we, we may do, we, we might try an, a, an eyebrow on. Um, it, is, it is a more lateral approach. The beauty of the subfrontal is you're coming straight down the midline and you, you can get between the, the two nerves and I think that's a good, a good approach, but clearly you need to come from above on this one with the chiasm pushed. Yes, and up. funny enough, this patient had seen another neurosurgeon that recommended endonasal. One with less experience than me on doing endonasal had recommended endonasal, and I thought it was a mistake. No, um, you're absolutely I, and Dan, quick question. Do you modify your eyebrow, for example, ever sacrifice the superorbital bundle to shift more medially 
uh, to get a more subfrontal approach as opposed to the more classic lateral uh, eyebrow? That's a good question. We, we don't typically, but you know, we, you certainly could, uh, as long as you, you know, you tell the patient that, um, you're going to have an um forehead for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, it's, it's not a huge deficit. And I think it's a reasonable thing to do because actually getting another centimeter or so medial can, can make, um, a significant difference. Um, so it, it's a, it's actually, it's a good thought. Good. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Let me move on. And then, because in related to that topic of, uh, eyebrow or, or front orbital approaches versus endonasal, we, I can share these two other cases. There was two other case examples, you know, tumor size is similar. Location is a bit different. So again, what is the optic apparatus? What is the optic nerve in relation to the tumor? So when I look at tuberculum salamin in geomas, as many of you do, you know, I, I want to see what, what is the relation of the tumor with the optic apparatus and with the optic nerves. If the tumor behaves such as like this, that the optic nerve is behind or above and the tumor is mostly medial to the optic nerve in the optic canals, for me, an endonasal approach is ideal. Um, when the tumor starts going over and lateral, then especially if it attaches to the dura above the clinoids, then I think about an open approach. But many tuberculum salamin and stay within these boundaries. And I do believe in the nasal is, is better because I can get better visualization, better access to the so-called infracasmatic region, even for large tumors like this. This patient, young patient, blind on the left eye. She let this go for too long. But you can see the beautiful video you can get from this endonasal approach. And we're again dissecting the same area. You see all those perforating branches. Uh, what a unique view the endonasal approach provides you. We're again dissecting underneath the, the, uh, the ACOM. And uh, just for all attendees, remember, again, uh, between optic chasm and tyrosoval arteries, always perforating branches to be preserved. Below, the perforating branches are the ones you are seeing here. These are... Um, superior hypophysial arteries, uh, branches, and we, are, we want to preserve those too. You can see how that left optic nerve looks terrible because of the uh, compression by the anterior cerebral artery, but this is a very nice resection, a uh, complete resection done in endonasally. Um, however, this other case, you see, if you look at the coronal, it goes over towards the orbital apex more than I want. And also I need to do a large skull base access and defect to get into this tumor. So this I would do through a, a, a frontal orbital approach. You can use an eyebrow, um, or in this case, I prefer to use you know, an incision behind the hairline. And I like to take the orbital ring for these cases um, because I do it usually on one piece. There are so many ways of doing it, but I like in one piece, because it's easy to reconstruct. But the one piece allows me to uh, uh, avoid any manipulation of the, of the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe where a significant amount of edema is not being touched uh, or retracted. And uh, I can get excellent access to the whole skull base. You see, I can peel the dural of the skull base. Uh, you can do extra dural first to the vascularize the tumor. And then you can preserve, you know, that's a frontal orbital artery. You can see nicely the olfactory tract and uh, gently dissected. This is the contralateral one and preserve for faction in a case like this. And you see, you can even take the dura on top of the clinoid and peel all this laterally. Um, now here becomes the part that is more tricky for me for these cases as we go deeper into the infracasmatic space. Um, so for this case, this is not difficult. I can deal with all this tumor uh, very well, but a more involved tumor in this infracasmatic space, I think is better than endonasally. Uh, I think you have better view, uh, but I still, you know, you can drill the optic canals, you can take the dura of the falciform ligament, you can take the dura of the precasmatic sulcus, but there is always some degree of manipulation of the optic apparatus you have to do in that area. Um, that's why endonasal, I think, is, in my opinion, superior for that area. But a tumor like this, I would rather do it from above um, because uh, I can tailor the skull base defect, I minimize manipulation of the uh, frontal lobes, and I'm not that worried about that optic canal invasion in a case uh, in a case like this. This is a case that probably done, you would have done with an eyebrow. I don't know about you, Paul, or, or uh, James, or any of you guys. 
Um, you want to make any comments? Uh, Juan, uh, that post-op scan is very interesting. You can see what's called the pneumosinus dilatans, which is very aerated that you typically see with tuberculum cellae. And I think initially you're tempted to do endonasal because you think there's a big airspace. But in fact, I think the cribriform plate hangs lower and sometimes can be obstructive to your trajectory. That, that is a very good point, uh, James. And another point you're, you're bringing up is that, yes, then you would have to go through some cribriform to get there, which would put the olfaction at risk, right? Yeah. I, I would say on this one, we'd definitely do it from above through an eyebrow. The other thing is on your coronal image there, it's really out over the optic canal. So not only would you, from an endonasal route, would you make the patient anosmic, you would definitely leave tumor behind, probably lateral to the canal there. So, I, And this is really more of a posterior planum it's kind of barely touching the tuberculum. It's almost partially an olfactory groove, you know, because it's pretty far forward. So I think yeah. the approach. Yeah. How do you how do you manage that most anterior olfactory sulcus? That dip down, you know, even when you drill down the orbital roof from an eyebrow, it's very difficult to really see that olfactory sulcus. You can put an endoscope and sort of burn it, but to get a more radical resection of that dura, I find very challenging through an eyebrow. Although I think the rest of it's ideal for an eyebrow. Yeah, I think with a 30 or 45 degree scope, you can you can get get to that and with, with angled bipolars. Um, you know, we we um, we've done a few of these, Garney, Barkadarian and I, where we've preserved olfaction. We we come from the side that um, the nerve looks the most compressed, and usually they're a little slightly off center. So if, if one of the olfactory nerves looks like it has a better cuff, we'll come from the contralateral side. And we'll, 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 we typically will sacrifice the ipsilateral olfactory because it, it's just, it's very hard to save that one. But if you save the other one, they're, they're good. Um, so yeah, I mean, getting, getting all the dura out is, is, a, is a challenge, I, I, I think. So that's a, you raise a good point. The only, the only other thing I would add, this case, I don't think it really applies, but for some of these that do extend down to infrachiasmatic space, and present primarily with vision loss, I'll sometimes plan to do two approaches because I think I get a better and more reliable visual decompression from below, but a more radical removal from above. And so combining an endonasal and eyebrow in two different stages separated in time is sometimes a consideration, but I, I don't think that applies here, but I'm curious, Juan, uh, uh, Dan, and, and James, how often you would choose to combine approach for competing interests. I've, I've done a few, I don't know if you guys, and even I've done that at the same time, um, but it becomes a bit painful, uh, usually for tumors, as you said, that are very large and not ideal for either approach. Yeah, I, I try to stick with one approach if possible. The, the rare occasion I do a simultaneously combined is um, sometimes you get these sinonasal recurrences from anterior skull base meningiomas where I think combining both at the same time is very useful, especially if you need a solution for reconstruction. To start introducing this next panel on posterior skull base tumors. We have the lower panelists with us together uh, today, and uh, we are honored to have you all, all with us. I'm going to start showing a few cases to uh, introduce this session. You see three tumors right here. And um, um, I'm going to show you how, for these three tumors, we do different approaches. This first one was sent to me for as a petrochlal meningioma um, uh, after progression for, with the radio surgery times two. But it really didn't look at petrochlal meningioma if you look back at it. Let me just. So this actually looks like a schwannoma. And how many trochlear schwannomas can you see <clears throat> in a presentation, right? So this happened to actually be a trochlear schwannoma. And, uh, if you look at the axis of the tumor, I decided to do this from posterior, different than your case, Pablo, that was actually compressing the pit ankle from anterior. Um, so you, it was great to go from anterior. <clears throat> this was going along the incisura, so I decided to go from the back, supracelebral transtentorial, and actually it worked beautifully. You can see the fourth nerve right there. You can see the urine of the tumor, which I'm cutting right now, the fourth nerve. And now I'm trying to separate this from the brainstem, and the plane is really bad. You just saw a vein there, and that vein is a very important landmark. It's the lateral mesencephalic vein. And what you see there is the third nerve, 
and the PCA as they go towards, you know, the thermal goes on top of the, uh, uh, towards the cavernous sinus. And that's at the end of the resection. So you want to you want to work along the long axis of the tumor anytime is possible. And this case was actually ideal for this supracerebellar route as opposed to, let's say, an endonasal route or a middle fossa. This other case um, had a retrosigmoid approach somewhere else. And they did that, you know, relatively, you know, resection, um, the left hand tumor. Uh, patient had severe trauma neuropathy. I followed the patient for some time, and in six months, the tumor was already growing. And so, in increasing edema in the brainstem and ataxia. So, then here I thought, how should we approach this tumor? Should we do retrosigmoid again, or should we try something different? So, we do in the nasal. So, we do, uh, you know, what do we do? So, I, for this one, I decided to do a combined transpetrosal, which I don't do very often, but uh, this is a middle fossa approach. You can see the uh, DSPN is being dissected all the way to V3. You see V3 being skeletonized. And now we're doing the, um, uh, the mastoid and the uh, semicircular canals all the way to the internal acoustic canal. And then going at to on top of the canal to drill. And this is the key drilling right here on top of between the canal towards the uh, V3. I love using that uh, uh, ultrasonic aspirator for that drilling. It is, I believe it's so much safer. And then the beautiful thing of this approach is put you right on the spot, right on the attachment of the tumor. We're cutting the tendon, you know, dissecting that uh, vein uh, attached to the tentorium. And then we're cutting the tentorium towards the incisura. We find the fourth nerve, as you see right there. And then we finish in cutting the tent. And we see five and the tumor just underneath. I can see actually Meckel's cave and open Meckel's cave with this knife and take the tumor from within Meckel's cave and the dura around it. And then I can work medial to the fifth nerve, lateral to the fifth nerve and right on the tumor, you know, and it's impressive how with this approach you can get right to the attachment. So I can detach the tumor from the petrous apex and petroclival junction and then I start rolling it. That's it in it from five. I found six anteriorly and I protected it. And then, you know, getting a very nice resection of this tumor. And yes, the last attachment is here in the petroclavial region. And then yes, closure of the dura. And then we bring this pericranial flap that is pedicle posteriorly to the occipital artery um, to uh, prevent the CSF leak. And uh, a nice complete resection and very good outcome. And I'm just going to show you, just to introduce, we also have the option of doing endonasal cases. This was had a combined transpetrosal years before, beautiful case uh, in the past, but this tumor had, you know, very, um, um, uh, you know, it's coming from anteriorly compressing the pit ankle or the brainstem, better said, the pons actually. And there is edema, there is, seems to be calcification, really difficult case. So I decided to go from anterior. Of course, it's been radiated, it's been on a bastin, you know, it really is a bad case. So I go transcavernous and take the posterior clinoid and you saw that we did a contralateral transmaxillary approach also to get a more lateral reach. And actually it worked really well. It gives me access right into the tumor, uh, right at the attachment source of the tumor. And I can, I was worried about the interface with the brainstem. And this gave me the best, in my opinion, access to that interface to uh, identify that plane and the perforating vessels. It was impossible to detach the tumor from the brainstem without injuring those vessels. So I had to leave a, a thin rim of tumor. But um, I think this worked really, really well for this, for this uh, case. So those are the few cases I want to show to introduce this next uh, part of the session.